Namaste, and welcome to another episode. <laughs> this, doing these videos, you have to understand, is like total bliss for me. <laughs> I really get a charge out of it because Yoga Vasishta is the highest knowledge. And if I can present the highest knowledge to even a small number of people out there, uh, if any of them get it, I mean, that's just the most wonderful thing in the world. So I'm very happy to be able to present this rare esoteric knowledge to the world. And maybe one of these days the world will actually appreciate it, but who cares? <laughs> I'm just having a blast doing it because it reflects my highest values. So let's talk about the acts of destiny. Such being the all destructive conduct of time and so on. What confidence, O great sage, can men like me have in them? We all remain here as slaves sold to fate and destiny, and we are deceived by their allurements as beasts of the forest. This fate, whose conduct is so very inhuman, is ever eager to devour all beings. He is constantly throwing men into the sea of troubles. He is moved by his malicious attempts to inflame minds with excessive desires, as the fire raises its flames to burn down a house. Destiny, the faithful and obedient wife of fate, is naturally fickle on account of being a female. She is always bent on mischief and disturbing patience. So here we have Rama now speaking as an ordinary human. And what is he doing? He's railing against fate. Huh? He's finding fault with destiny. He's criticizing time. And actually, he's disagreeing with God. He's saying, you should have made this world more convenient for us humans. <laughs> you should have made it in such a way that we can make our little plans here and actually succeed. Huh? But no, no, you're not going to do that. <laughs> Instead, you're going to treat us like slaves and deceive us like animals. Huh? You're going to ruin all our plans and dash all our hopes. So what, what hope do we have? What confidence can we have in life, in the world? You see, this is actually the right attitude. He's coming to correct conclusions by his own reason, which is something that more of us should do. Huh? When observing how life usually goes, huh? We make a plan, and then it gets smashed, <laughs> and we make another one, and then that gets smashed, and so on. So after a while, doesn't it ever sink in? That we cannot rely on nature, on fate, on time, on God, to further our desires. Nevertheless, the world seems to be full of desirable things. And we go from one to the next to the next, trying to enjoy, trying to possess, identifying with and, and seeing them as ours. And yet they're not ours and they get ripped away by the hand of time, by the force of fate. And so we become disappointed, we become frustrated and angry. But that's not anybody's fault but our own because we are trying to do something that's impossible. We are trying to take the waves of the ocean and make them stop moving and stake a claim to them and put a fence around them and say they're ours. But they're not ours and they never will be ours because they are just manifestations that come into view and pass away. My mother used to sing this song. <laughs> the way you wear your hat, 
the way we danced till three. The memory of all that, oh, they can't take that away from me. Poor mom. <laughs> yes, they can take it away. And at the end of this life, all our memories, all our impressions, all our thoughts and words and deeds are going to be washed away by this flood of time. And there's nothing we can do to get them back. It's like they never even happened, and which is actually the case, as we will see later on in Yoga Vasishta. What reliance can there be on men like us when even the gods are liable to destruction, when the polar star is known to change its place, when the very moon is to vanish along with the sky, when the very sun is to be split into pieces, and when fire itself is to become frigid and cold, when the very gods Hari and Brahma are to be absorbed into the Great One, Brahman, and when Shiva himself is to be no more, when the duration of time comes to be counted, when destiny is destined to her final destiny, and when all emptiness loses itself in infinity. That which is inaudible, unspeakable, invisible, and unknowable in his real form displays to us these wonderful worlds by some fallacy. No one conscious of himself can disown his subjection to that being who dwells in the hearts of everyone. Well, this is wonderful <laughs> because even as he's stating the problem, he also states the solution. That what reliance can there be on men like us? Huh? Or the objects of the world? When everything is just illusory and temporary, changeable and fabricated. And at the end of time, when destiny comes due, then everything simply disappears. Huh? down the whirlpool of time into the emptiness of the absolute. So the answer is hidden in the question. If we can't count on, if we can't rely on this world and ourselves and phenomena in general, then what we can rely on is that very absolute, that very eternal, immortal, uh, self of all that uh, extends this cosmic manifestation like a dream and then winds it up and dissolves it as if waking from sleep. That's the real meaning of this. You see, he is giving the solution covertly as part of the question. And then, of course, Vasishta will bring this out once he begins his reply to Rama's questions. And he also says, who can disown, who can deny that this unspeakable, unknowable absolute, which resides in our own hearts, is really the reality of everything? Who can deny it? In other words, that Actually, deep down, faith in God is universal. And when people are in trouble, even professed atheists have been known to pray. Uh, there are no atheists in foxholes. <laughs> Who can count the number of beings resembling the waves of the ocean and on whom death has been darting the undersea fire of destruction? All mankind is deluded to entrap themselves in the snare of greed and be afflicted with all evils in life as the deer entangled in the thickets of a jungle. The desire of pleasure is as vain as the expectation of reaping fruit from a vine growing in the sky. Yet I know not why men of reason would not understand this truth. The people say, this is a day of festivity, a season of joy, and a time of procession. 
Here are our friends. Here are the pleasures, and here are a variety of our entertainments. Thus do men of vacant minds amuse themselves with weaving the web of their desires until they become extinct. So we see this every day, huh? We see it all the time. Just open any uh, Facebook or Reddit or any news uh, site and start reading and you'll see that people's minds are concentrated on their pleasures. And why is that? To counteract the miseries of desiring pleasure. Because it usually doesn't work out, does it? Usually what happens is we desire pleasure, but we get misery instead. <laughs> this is the human condition. Come on. It's been this way forever. And it will always be this way. As long as we try to rely on desire, phenomena, pleasure, the senses, the mind, the ego, <laughs> the body, all these things are false. And this is just the beginning. This is just the setup for the message, the real message of Yoga Vasishta. The real message of Yoga Vasishta is, first of all, this world is an illusion. Don't put your trust and faith in it. Don't try to own it, possess it, enjoy it, or count on it in any way. You will be disappointed. So then, what is there? Well, then we have to enter into that absolute truth, which is eternal. That Brahman, which emanates all things and which absorbs them again at the end. That is the only security. That is the only happiness. That is the only thing we can really count on in life. So why delay? Why continue in the old ways? Huh? There's a saying in Texas. My son lives in Texas. He told me about this. <laughs> When all you do is what you've done, what you get is what you got. <laughs> In other words, if you keep on doing the same old thing, things will turn out the same old way. If you expect things to be different or better, you have to do something different. Learn, change, adapt, progress. Huh? There is no progression without destruction. In other words, we have to give up what we think we have and what we think we are in order to move on to something better. This is just the way it is, is nobody can do anything about it. If we want our lives to be better, we have to be willing to change, to destroy what we think we are and to become something better. And how do we do that? Through yoga. Yoga vasishta. Uh -huh. Yoga means joining. It comes from the word yukt, which means to join or to hook up things together like a cart and a horse. So what are we doing here? We're joining ourselves with God. Yoga yukta prasanatma na sochati na kangshati. In Bhagavad Gita it says, one who is engaged in yoga neither laments nor desires to have anything. Why? How is it possible? Because yoga is such a great pleasure that it obviates the need for any other. In fact, it just destroys all desires because there couldn't be anything as wonderful as the pleasure, the bliss of yoga, real yoga, uh, not just gymnastics <laughs> and sweating. <laughs> That's not even yoga. Real yoga means joining our consciousness with God. Aung Tatsa. Aung Harihi Aung. 
கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் கீதா